if that's not got you in the mood for uh, for tonight, uh, I don't know what, what wouldn't. We've got a fantastic night lined up for you. Um, we've got a live audience. We're proud to be at the Barnsley Sixth Form College. Um, and um, we're, we've got the eyes of the world on us tonight. We've got people watching from Spain, from Germany, and yet yeah, I believe also from Cairo. So uh, the world is looking at Tut here in Barnsley today and for valid reasons. Obviously we're just coming to the end of a five month campaign where we've had a fantastic exhibition, uh, Tut 22, The Life of Tut and Karma, uh, curated by Professor John Fletcher uh, and hosted by Barnsley Museums and involving Bolton Museum. And you're going to find out a lot more about the background to all that, the details about it all. We've got a great night, like I say, we're going to be speaking to two of our most eminent Egyptologists uh, uh, both TV experts, but also both uh, uh, university lecturers and, uh, and, and held in such great world esteem that it's fantastic to have the connection with them here in Barnsley. Um, so my first uh, guest uh, uh, tonight uh, that we're going to bring out here is going to be uh, Professor Joanne Fletcher, uh, and then we'll be speaking to Stephen Buckley, a partner and colleague, afterwards. Um, so, um, be, be, before we do that, I just need to just remind you about uh, Professor uh, Joan Fletcher, or Jill, as we like to call her tonight. She's the amazing TV presenter whose uh, documentaries have been seen by millions of people around the world, including things like Immortal Egypt and Ancient Egypt, the life and death in the Valley of the Kings. And with her partner, Dr. Stephen Buckley, they've gone on to win things like BAFTAs, and we've actually got the BAFTA with us tonight as well, so uh, we'll be talking about that in detail that was for the extraordinary mummifying Alan, Egypt's last secret, where a taxi driver, Alan, uh, was mummified. Oh, unbelievable. Uh, but he got baffed it with that good. Um, uh, books include uh, The Story of Egypt, uh, Cleopatra the Great, and The Search for Nefertiti, and more. Uh, she regularly writes for newspapers and magazines, uh, not least of all BBC History magazine. Uh, and in 2003, a lot of you might not know this, but she designed the first UK GCSE equivalent for Egyptology. Um, Joe's a visiting professor uh, in the Department of Archaeology at the University of York, and she's head of local ambassador program uh, for the Egypt Exploration Society. She's also chair of trustees at Scarborough Museums and Galleries, as well as her work with museums around the UK and Europe, and she's patron of Barnsley Museums and Heritage Trust, and we're so proud about that to have her as uh, one of our own. Um, <clears throat> over the last 30 years, she's also worked on archaeological uh, excavations and led expeditions, including one which first identified the mummified bo body of uh, Egyptian ruler Nefertiti. Um, controversial? Well, we'll be talking about that tonight. Um, and um, obviously, she's also just uh, curated the uh, uh, Tut Life of Tutankhamen exhibition here at Experience Barnsley that actually ends on Saturday. If you've not been to see it, I'd urge you to go see it. It's absolutely amazing. Um, but her proudest achievement, and she's been telling me, and no doubt a bit more tonight, is that receiving the freedom of Barnsley, uh, which means she can draw her sword and walk sheep through this town centre. <laughs> Uh, and Rita Britton, who's another, uh, who's got a freedom, who's here with us tonight as well, also tells me it means that you can actually decide whose house you want to stay in overnight. So that's, I don't know who Joe and Steve's going to be going on with tonight. You can take your pick, but there you go. So before I bring Joe out, uh, first of all, we've just got a little video clip. Let's remind ourselves how great she is, uh, her t fabulous TV work. Ancient Egypt, one of the most fascinating civilizations on Earth. But what was it like to be an ancient Egyptian, living in this incredible place? It's okay trying to understand ancient Egypt on a visual level, pyramids, king tut, mummies, but to really get into the heads of the ancient Egyptians, you've got to walk in their footsteps. I'm Egyptologist Dr Joanne Fletcher and I've spent over 40 years obsessed with this lost world. While the magnificent temples and tombs of the pharaohs can tell us one story, I'm interested in another, the story of ordinary people, the real Egyptians. It's such a privilege. We're amongst their family here. This feeling of closeness, of warmth, of love. I'm going to uncover evidence about how they lived their lives. Oh, wow. 
it's a glimpse into the sort of world of ancient Egyptian interior design and reveal what they hoped for in death. There was no Grim Reaper, just this beautiful goddess wanting to embrace them in her warm arms. And there is one very special couple I want to get to know as I journey to their desert village home and examine the treasures from their tomb. You can only imagine his pride and joy at receiving such a mark of royal favour as we discover what life was really like in ancient Egypt. So, ladies and gentlemen, can you uh, be upstanding, I guess, for Professor John Fletcher? Hey. Hi everybody. Brolly, good show. I think we've been I have to bring it. it. It's, we've had rain, haven't we, today? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think you can safely say, Joe, that you're amongst friend, friends yeah. tonight. Um, yeah. And as I was saying earlier, um, they, just, just to reiterate and underline how popular you've become. Um, we've got people watching from around the world tonight, including some people watching from Cairo, which is just yeah. remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. It's just yeah. wonderful. Some lovely people. So, um, Joe, this is uh, such a wonderful evening. I know we've been talking about trying to make this happen for about three or four years, um, and I know you don't. It's quite rare that you do something like this. I refuse on many an occasion. Yeah, I think I've only ever done uh, a couple of events like this, and both of them were in Barnsley, actually at Birdwell. Um, and uh, it's it's important for me to to keep coming back home and and, and doing things like this. But I've, I turned down all other such invitations, of which there are many. Well, thank you for, uh, for, the, for, for doing this for us tonight. And uh, just Pleasure. remind everybody again as well, this is celebrating um, your careers, but we're also celebrating the Toon Carmen exhibition yeah. that you're doing here in Barnsley, and we'll come on to that in a second. But first of all, I just want to start at the beginning, and, and really, we've, we've, we've come full circle. Um, I mean, looking at my notes here, uh, is that this building that used to be Barnsley um, Library, is where you actually picked up a library book that sparked it all in the first place. Uh, uh, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, um, from as, as long as I could remember, I've been obsessed by ancient Egypt, by the pictures in my parents' uh, history books at home. Um, the one that started it at home was my mum's copy of uh, the Tutankhamun book back in the 60s and 70s. And according to my mum uh, at nursery school up Race Common Road, I spent many a happy hour drawing the gods of Egypt in wax crayon. Nobody else could tell they were the gods of Egypt, but I knew they were. Um, and then, of course, uh, growing up, uh, I, I became even more fixated and spent a lot of time in Barnsley Library. I'm that old. I remember it when it was above the Civic Hall and then when it came here, that beautiful new building that we had. Forget all the boring storybooks, beeline for ancient Egypt. And this was my most favourite one because it has the most amazing diagram of how the ancient embalmers removed the brain down the nose. I, as a six-year-old, I thought that was the business. So, I, I loved it. So, I loved and, it. And this, Jill, is the actual library book. That's that the book. Are, and in fact, I had a sneak peek in here, and you should have returned this on March the 26th, <laughs> 1972. So I think that's about a £3,500 fine that you owe me. Well I, worth every penny. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, I, I mean, obviously, it did spark. The uh, the great interest uh, in that and and uh, and uh, but there were there were lots of other things in lots of important people in your life as well yeah um, and then we came to 1972 and the touring exhibition yeah, took yeah. can you just explain about how we got more involved yeah well obviously for the very first time two and Carmen's treasures came uh, to Britain they came to uh, London to the British Museum they didn't come up to Barnsley which I think was an oversight on someone's part um, and people would queue for hours and hours 
um, to four hours on average, I think, to get a glimpse of these amazing things. And of course, Tutankhamun was all over the news. He was on Blue Peter. That's how famous he was. And obviously, by the grand old age of six, I was a, an, you know, an old hand at uh, ancient Egypt. I, I, I loved it so much. And I was going on and on about it over dinner one night to my mum. And she said, Joanne, if you really are that interested, there are people who do this as a job, Egyptologists. And get paid. Yeah, well, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the light bulb moment in my entire 56 years on planet Earth, the age of six, mum telling me that, that, that's it, that's what I'm going to do, that's all I've ever done. I've never looked back. Fabulous. So in terms of Tutankhamun, before we go into explaining your career, we, we're just going to um, have a, a little look at the 22 exhibition that's on. We have a little news report and then we're going to talk about it a little bit more in detail um, and, and, and also we, we've got a couple of announcements to make on the back of it. So if we can just show the 22 news report, that would be fabulous. <laughs> Welcome to Tut 22, The Life of Tutankhamun, here at Experience Barnsley. It's a wonderful new exhibition and it's running for six months. And now it's 2022, which is the centenary of the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. So this is the time to celebrate the greatest archaeological discovery of all time. Now what many people don't know is that the name of Tutankhamun was first found in the Valley of the Kings and recognised as being of great importance by a wonderful archaeologist called Harold Jones. And Harold Jones came from Barnsley, in fact, just up the street from this very museum. So the links between our town and Tutankhamun himself are very strong. Harold Jones was a wonderful, wonderful archaeologist who died tragically young in the Valley of the Kings and it's thanks to the clues that Harold Jones found that allowed his friends Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter to follow the trail first discovered by Harold to ultimately make the greatest archaeological discovery of all time in 1922. Now we have other local links too because all the objects in this room are on loan from Bolton Museum whose fabulous world-renowned Egyptology collection is a wonderful thing and of course their earliest curators, the first two curators at Bolton Museum we've recently discovered came from Barnsley and we have a very strong working relationship with Bolton's current curator, the wonderful Ian Trumbull that's made all this possible. Now one of the strengths of this exhibition is it's predominantly ancient Egyptian artefacts from the time of Tutankhamun himself. We also have exact replicas of wonderful images of Tutankhamun and his family, including his stepmother, the great Nefertiti. But the real cherry on the cake is the way that digital technology has allowed us even to bring Tutankhamun's golden death mask all the way from Cairo here to the heart of Barnsley. Yeah, so absolutely remarkable exhibition. I, I just wondered, just as a show of hands in the room, how many of you have actually been to see it? Okay, All right, we good. are amongst yeah. friends, Joe. Yeah, that's um, good. Uh, but the, the one thing I would say is that you're not alone. I think um, the last count I heard that we've had about 40,000 people who've actually been to see it, which is four arenas full of people who've that's been so to, uh, to Barsley to see the exhibition, which is terrific. Uh, and it was actually, um, uh, we, we, we had Ian Trumbull there, the curator from yeah. Bolton Museum. They need a special mention because they've loaned about, well, many of the 300 objects. Yeah, here. Bolton Museums, the, 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 the curator, the, the staff at Bolton have been extraordinary. And they've, they've allowed us to basically bring to Barnsley all these key elements from uh, things that represent Tutankhamun's life, but also things from the city in which he was born, the city of Amarna. And it's a world-class collection, it really is. So what a privilege to have this material enhanced so much by the fact that the original curator, um, the, um, William Midgley, actually his parents came from Cawthorn, not far away, so all roads always lead back to Barnsley, I think. Uh, well, you always manage to find the roads that lead back to Barnsley, Joe. Yeah. I don't know what it is about that. But um, <laughs> it, um, it, it, if you do get a chance, if you've not been to the exhibition and you, and you still get a chance that you can get there before Saturday, 
go have a look at it because um, just the, the history wall that you've created down there is remarkable with its um, connection to Carter and the tomb and and Calinol and, and and various other things. Just 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 a wonderful exhibition. It must take hours and hours of research. Is it a yeah. labour of love? Joe? It's certainly a labour of love. It's stuff that I just I just do all the time. I mean, the history wall that's going to be permanent at Experience Barnsley that represents the last thirty years of my life in terms of the, the research that goes on. There isn't literally a day goes by when I'm not ferreting out some little nugget somewhere. But I think the secret of it is there are two places I love most in the world: Yorkshire, especially Barnsley, obviously and Egypt, you put them together, it's like nuclear fusion. You get <laughs> magic. And for so long, British Egyptology, let's face it, is focused on London and the South East, which is lovely for them, but it's not much good for us, is it? So uh, I think it's about time that, you know, let's broaden out this subject. Let's find our local connections, our local links that go back, British Egyptology links, go back to the 17th century in this country, and it all started in Yorkshire. Well, the remarkable thing, I think, here as well is that you've actually rewritten Harold Jones back into the history books. Um, I always keep still wanting to say our Jones. Are they the pop every time I mention it? It's a combination of it. Um, Harold... Um, it's, it's like Harold Lloyd, the silent film star, and Howard Jones, the 80s synth player. So, yeah, but it's definitely Harold Jones. <laughs> it's sometimes uh, we see him uh, represented as Ernest Jones as well. Yeah, as his first, first name. name which yeah. happens typically with Egyptologists. Yeah, for so, cause, because I never use my first name. Jones my second name. So uh -huh. First exclusive yeah, tonight. Yeah, yeah. So come on. Lots of, lots of people What's do that. What's your first that. name then, Jones? Amy, which is a beautiful name, but I'm not an Amy. Oh. Amy is somebody that behaves himself. I'm more of a... <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a Joe, I think. Um, but yeah, a lot of us do seem to just, you know, initialise the first name and go with the second. And I don't know why, but it's very widespread. Now, now one thing that um, he's become really known for is the fact that he was the first, one of the first people to actually discover the name Tutankhamun. And it, it, if he'd have lived, um, tragically, yeah. he didn't, but if he'd have lived long enough, you believe that he may have actually found it. He could well have done, because the, the point about Harold Jones, he was meticulous. He'd trained as a fine artist. He came out to Egypt for his health. He, he'd suffered from tuberculosis from being a very small child. So the drier weather initially was very good for him. And he was so brilliant. He was an archaeological artist in the days when cameras were only just, you know, becoming the norm on excavations. And his artwork was exquisite. And within a few years, he'd picked up skills needed to be an archaeologist. And he, he worked at some incredible places. He worked at Amarna, birthplace of Tutankhamun. He worked right across Egypt. He was in great demand um, by, uh, from archaeologists working the length and breadth of the country because he was so talented as a draftsman, as an artist and as a meticulous archaeologist. And he was made an offer he couldn't refuse to work in the Valley of the Kings. Um, and from about 1907 up to the year of his death in 1911, he made some extraordinary discoveries. He also recognised the importance of discoveries other people had made it was, it was really Harold, more than anyone else, that kept noticing this name, Tutankhamun, his throne name, Neb Kepurure, that kept cropping up on small items in and around the Valley of the Kings. And this is well before Tutankhamun's name meant anything to anybody, years before the tomb itself was found. So I think if he'd had his you know, uh, full, uh, lifelong period to, he to, to do this. He actually died in the Valley of the Kings. Yes, he did. So. Uh, only a few days after his 34th birthday, he died in the dig house in the Valley of the Kings. Um, his funeral was uh, overseen by Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter, um, who, uh, Lord Carnarvon, was very kind to Harold throughout his life. Um, in fact, he was a, a sort of... Uh, he, he supported Harold... Uh, many years before he then turned his attentions to Howard Carter. So in that respect, you just have all these what-ifs in, yeah. in your mind. You know, this lad born on Sackville Street, literally just across the well, road. Well, interesting point. I know that there are moves for a blue plaque outside his house. Yes, uh, indeed. How much would you like to see that happen? 
uh, very, very much. Yeah. Well, <laughs> very, very much. I well, mean, that would just be, little, we, yeah. we're gonna, I think we're going to make this up. Can you imagine, though, the, the legacy coming off the exhibition, yeah. and, you know, a flag in the sand for Harold and for our town and its importance? Well, we're you know, celebrating the, the 100th anniversary of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, but that anniversary is going to go on, isn't it? Because I think it was two years or so before they even uncovered the death mask and yeah. found out a lot it of was, It was the best part of a decade that Howard Carter was, was meticulous to, and in the many years it took to clear the tomb of 5,000 plus objects, they all had to be photographed, drawn, measured, conserved. Some of these things were almost three, well, they were all three and a half thousand years old, but very, very delicate and infinite care was taken to remove them from the tomb um, and to take them to Cairo Museum. So it was, it was a very, very long process. You, you've actually been many times, Joe, um, but do you, do, do you still, does it still tend to send a shiver down oh, your yeah. spine? Do you still get yeah. a big thrill? Yeah. I mean, Egypt's magic. It's, it's other than Barnsley and Yorkshire, it is the best place in the world. <laughs> And uh, the Egyptians are fabulous people, and, and it's always a total joy to be there. Total joy. Well, just reflecting on the exhibition, we'd like to announce tonight as well that as from tomorrow, um, the exhibition, although its doors will close on Saturday, they will always stay open because a virtual tour has been created um, uh, that you, you'll be able to have a, a walk around it. And it's got some amazing hot spots in there where you can actually almost take items off the shelf and spin them round and look at them in great detail. It, it's quite wonderful, isn't it? It's amazing. Um, before we talk about it, there's a little clip that I'd just like to show that um, actually shows uh, the mapping of the actual uh, museum. Again, that just uh, gives you the impression of what that's like, and how new technology has been used to be able to bring, uh, I suggest, the library book to life now. I mean, what would the little six-year-old girl have thought of that if she could have seen that then? Oh, I'd have just been so giddy. <laughs> I just, just mind-blowing stuff. It, it, I mean, even now, it, it just blows my mind, you know, this, this level of technology. It's bringing ancient Egypt to everyone on the planet. How it, brilliant is that? It, it is. We've got a little bit more video. We're going to look at that in a second. But when we're talking about technology, Joe, as well, these 3D replicas here have been created so that kids can get an hands-on feel yeah. of, a, of an artifact that they wouldn't normally be able to do. And, and indeed, some of the amulets that have been created on the back of this that are like, you know, were created 3,000 years old. The technology is, is remarkable, isn't it? It's, it is a wonderful thing because it's a fantastic teaching aid uh, I mean, can you imagine, uh, there, are, there are children up and down the country that, that certainly can't afford to, a day trip to the British Museum, they, they can't afford the time and certainly not the cost, let alone go to Egypt. So to bring ancient Egypt into the classroom physically, to let children handle these objects, yeah. which are exact in every dimension, <coughs> and yet if, if somebody dropped this particular Nefertiti on a head. It, just it, make another one. Just make another one. But that is, is, is mind-blowing, and I think that will have real repercussions, I think, for the way people engage with ancient Egypt. As I said, it's, it's amazingly democratic, and I love that. I love the, that. The other amazing thing that we've done in the exhibition together as well is that we've been able to augment some of the objects, so that, and literally we, we've got some posters at the front of us here, actually, and for people who are here live tonight, if, if you want um, um, a poster afterwards and tip a pound or so to the, uh, the trust. That's the nice, Museum and Heritage um, Trust. Or if you yeah. want to come and um, have a look and get your hands on some of the, uh, well, I don't think the BAFTA, but certainly <laughs> yeah. the Nefertitis, if you'd like to 
I have, I've pictures with them. By all means, come down and have a look at that. Um, uh, but yeah, just just remarkable technology. Um, now we, we've got a little bit more video um, of the walkthrough because we, we're not there tonight, but we can try and show people both online and here. And uh, we'll kill the uh, the music on this so that we can just talk about it, Joe, while okay. we're watching it on this on the screen. This, like I say, is going to be going live um, uh, from tomorrow. You'll, if you follow any of the Barnsley Museum social media sites, you'll find out all the links of where you can actually get your hands on and actually walk around this yourself. But it, it is, it's a beautiful space, isn't it? And oh, yeah. um, some amazing objects here. Just tell me about some of the things that we're whizzing through here. Well, it's obviously themed. There are 10 uh, cases and it sort of tells a sequential story of Tutankhamun's birth, life, upbringing um, at the city of Amarna, focusing on different aspects, the environment at Amarna, uh, the palace, the soft furnishings. I love all that kind of stuff. So uh, there's quite a lot in that case. There's a case about the food and drink, the kind of things that Tutankhamun would have eaten and, and drunk on a daily basis. There's, and there's, there's lots of videos and pictures, yeah. slideshows, yeah. all kinds of, and lots of information in well, here. Well, the Joe. beauty of it is people can go in at any level. You can just have a quick walk around, all very nice, look at the objects, or you can engage with the labels. We've got straightforward labels, more in-depth labels. You can then click on some of the hotspots. You can read, read magazines, magazines online, watch film clips, Clips. It's it's extraordinary, you know. You can you can follow the links to other sites. And, and to so learn this more. this is where, like like we said, it's almost like you can reach in and and, and yeah. look at the artifact and bring it up yeah. big and, and turn it round and spin it and examine it in detail. So it's um it's it is a remarkable resource. This isn't it, Joe? It is. It's absolutely incredible. We, we'll also mention that actually, uh, um, aside from Barnes and Museums pushing this, this will be actually on your new brand new website that we're announcing <laughs> later as well. I have entered the twenty first century. Well, twentieth century at long last. I've never had my own website, and as of today. I've got one. <laughs> but it, oh, th this also shows the breadth of the, the fantastic um, uh, artefacts, um, and as we said, uh, many of them are loan from, from Bolton, uh, from yeah. Bolton Museum yeah. as well. So again, It's been a real bolton Bowsley mashup. this. It's been a, a wonderful a collaboration in yeah. the very best sense. It's been fabulous. It, it, it has. It, it's, it's been wonderful, hasn't it? Um, and um, obviously, lots of, of, of more things to come, um, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll mention that. Um, in fact... I, I did. I did just want to to say that um, I, I saw a, a fantastic exhibition at the British Museum um, just just before Christmas, which was about the um, cracking the hieroglyphs code. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I believe that's on tour. And you you might be involved with that. It's well, the opening night for this travelling exhibition. Uh, it's opening at Hull at the Ferns Art Gallery. The opening event was tonight. Uh, we were invited to that, and I said, I'm sorry. I've got a prior engagement. Um, but yeah, that opens uh, Saturday, I believe. And we're obviously doing events for that on the 29th of April. We've got a couple of um, talks as part of that. So it's nice to uh, sort of be involved with that too, really. So we've already mentioned you about how you, you, you kind of got sparked the interest and then the two exhibition came along and I think captivated a lot of us, didn't it? Not yeah. least of all yourself. Um, but in, in terms of um, the, the question that a lot of kids will, will, be, will be looking and watching this today as well, and wondering, how do you become a world-famous TV Egyptologist? What, what was the story? What, what, where did you have to study? And how did you get the lucky break? Well, uh, I, I just really, uh, I've just been very single-minded. This is all I've ever been interested in, and it's all I've ever wanted to do. And... To be honest, it's all I ever could do because I was not, not that bright at anything else. I mean, I counted up to save my life. Uh, but ancient Egypt, that's a different matter. Um, and so I just, you know, my mum always said work hard at school. That's the secret to it. When I was 15, my parents had saved up, sent me out to Egypt for the very first time. I went with my wonderful auntie that had just retired from Marks and Spencers. So she went having retired. I went as a 15-year-old um, schoolgirl. And uh, it, it, as my mum intended, it blew my mind and it really focused my attention on the forthcoming O-levels, which we had before GCSEs. Then I went to, uh, this was at the, the high school on Huddersfield Road, and then I, I stayed on there when it became a sixth form college, did my A-levels. There was only one university I wanted to study at, and that was University College London, because it 
it's just got such a great history, a really illustrious past. Its own museum, the Petri Museum of Egyptian Archaeology, I thought that's the place for me. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd get accepted, but it was amazing. They said, yeah, fine. I couldn't believe it. So uh, off I went, three years at University College, being taught by some incredible, incredible people. Um, what a privilege, really. And I, at that time, I also joined the Egypt Exploration Society, which does such amazing work, amazing work, promoting Egyptian heritage um, around the world. And I'm very, very proud to be a, an ambassador for the society, which, uh, you know, I urge everybody to look, look it up online and consider supporting it. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Um, and so, yeah, I mean... Basically, it just comes down to focusing, reading all you can about the subject, absorbing everything you can from museum visits and so forth, and just keep going, you know. No, no you, you're so reading all you can about the subject. You actually studied German, I believe, just yeah. so that you could actually read some yeah. Egyptology yeah. texts. Well, I did the three-year degree at, at UCL at Lynn London, came home for a year and went to the, the tech, as it was, uh, at the top of Old Mill Lane and uh, studied German and did a German for Historians course also. I'm still rubbish at German, but at least I can get by when it's, you know, in terms of, of reading the necessary uh, sort of texts and things that are a, a fundamental part of Egyptology. Um, and then I embarked on a PhD. I, I'd become fascinated by mummified remains. These fabulous people that created this wonderful civilization, their ability to preserve themselves in such an amazing way means we can now look into the faces of these people thousands of years later and that is a, a rare privilege. And so I thought, well, I'll do a PhD. You need a PhD um, to, to, to go further in the subject. So I thought, focus on mummified remains, specifically the hair, because believe it or not, with this. Um, I've always been fascinated by hair and we've got a lot of hairdressers in the family. The ones who weren't coal miners were hairdressers. Um, so I thought, yeah, that, that really appeals. And I, I did a PhD um, over the Pennines um, in Manchester. So I really must have been committed to, you know what I'm saying, uh, to go over that side. Although I, I have to say, uh, I, I did there in the late 80s embark on a, a, a very long relationship with Bolton Museum yeah. uh, and, and now our friends in Wigan Museum too, some wonderful colleagues over, over the hills. So, so um, obviously you, you threw yourself at the subject, but when did you get involved in TV and how did that Oh, wow, out? that was, uh, oh yeah, that was probably 1997. Um, after I got my PhD, knowing I would never get a job in this subject, uh, not a real job, uh, <laughs> because I'm not well connected and I'm not posh. I think that it comes down to that. So I thought, fair enough, I'll be a self-employed Egyptologist. Everybody thought that was hilarious. What does a self-employed Egyptologist do, Joanne? So confidence of you, thought it was all going to be fine. Um, I started teaching Egyptology at evening classes, doing bits and pieces of writing, things like that. And a few weeks, literally probably a couple of weeks into this new career, I was contacted by someone I'd met at a conference. Would I be part of a small team working in Cairo at the medical school um, on mummified remains? The ones that aren't in Cairo Museum uh, are in the medical school museum. I said, yeah, thank you. Um, and I spent six weeks in the company of some amazing ancient people, studying them, conserving them, really... Uh, just focused on 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 the, the subject I love so much, I couldn't believe I was actually doing this as a job, and and I was, and I still can't believe it. I still can't believe I'm I'm sat here now talking to you about well, it. Well, you know what? I mean, the fact is that you 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 went on TV, and you've got this very iconic look. So as you are tonight, well, you dress all in black. You've got your red shock hair. You walk around with a big brolly, and you rediscover ancient Egypt in the Barnsley dialect. I mean, what's not to like? <laughs> Well, that, well, the telly started when we were at the medical school. A film crew turned up and said, uh, will you tell us what you're doing? And all I had to do was talk to the nice man behind the camera. And I have been called a gob on a stick. So it was quite easy to blah, 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 blah. Piece of cake. Uh, and then someone saw that and I did more of it and, and all this kind of thing. So uh, 
I mean, the blacks just, I've, you know, from being a teenager, I've always been a goth. I think of one of the, was it Telegraph? One of the newspapers, a review of one of the shows said, that I am the goth Mary Poppins, which I thought were quite good. <laughs> and the umbrella's vital. I mean, look, at, am I pasty or what? Five seconds in that sun and I, I'm I burnt to a crisp. So it's very convenient. It's so convenient. It keeps me in the shade. And I never thought do things about it you know it's just who I am and and people have sort of thought oh is this for telly it's like no I, I dress like this when it's chucking it down and I'm walking on beach in Scarborough you know or, or, instantly or, recognizable yeah, yeah. wherever you go um <laughs> and talking of which um I, the fame that that's brought you as well we did mention earlier that you know um the fact is that you can be in a supermarket now or even on a train full of football fans leaving <laughs> Barnsley as you were only a couple of weeks ago and um the mood changed when they saw it Oh, it was Professor Joe, and they wanted to know all about Egyptology. How do you cope with it? How do you cope with the fame? It's, it's all right. I mean, it's it's usually when I'm in the supermarket and uh, I've nipped out, you know, and uh, but I've made some lovely friends. I mean, I, there's a a couple who, are, who have joined us tonight from Scarborough, Penelope and John. Hello, Penelope and John. I'm waving at the camera. Um, and they're in Scarborough, and they're wonderful people. Who I met in Sainsbury's, actually. Um, <laughs> and waited it off. So you don't have to go to Cairo to meet people. No, all it, people all over, all over the place. And it's because uh, people love Egypt, and I love Egypt. So what's not to like? It's wonderful chatting to people about things, and, you know. And, and top tips for people who are going over to Egypt. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I was always told, like, the old cricket message was all in whites because it kept the sun off Listen, back. listen, how many times have I been asked, why do you wear black? People get themselves into such a tiz about it. So many people, why don't you wear white? You always look hot. It's like, mate, it's, I, I could be wearing a pink tutu, I'd be hot, you know. The point is, black is the colour to wear because black, as everybody knows, absorbs heat. So when my body temperature's doing this, this fabulous jacket absorbs it, keeps me cool. Also, when I'm in Egypt, it's a great mark of respect because older ladies, married ladies, when they're not inside the house, they wear black. And I've been adopted by the most fabulous Egyptian family for the last 20 or so years. They are wonderful, wonderful people. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're fabulous. And I spend a lot of time with the ladies of the house. And, you know, this is what they wear. I'm in their country. I'm respecting their culture. Um, another reason it doesn't show up the muck as, as much <laughs> as a on a morning like. when when you exactly <laughs> when you get up at five o'clock in the morning for another early start before the sun rises when you're trying to coordinate your outfit no coordination needed it's all black it all matches <laughs> um, and ultimately as I said I was a bit of a goth and at the end of the day I just like it yeah, wonderful and just top tips if people are planning a trip to go over and, and particularly to look at the um, the sites of ancient Egypt. What, what, what two or three top tips would you say to people? I would say definitely take an umbrella, a pair of sunglasses or a hat, lots of sun cream. Um, probably also look at the sites that you're visiting, see if they open in the evenings because places like Luxor Temple are phenomenal in the evening. When it's getting dusk, the temperature's dropping, really fabulous. Um, if you real, really are a nutcase like me, think about going in August because you'll have many of the sites to yourself because it'll be so flipping hot. But, you know, once your body's past a certain temperature, it's all much of a muchness. <laughs> and I find that because I get so fixated about things, I, I don't actually notice the heat. It's, it's sometimes in retrospect you think, wow, that was a bit of a toasty day today. But uh, <laughs> and, and, and just... Just, you know, if, if you can, do visit Egypt. And the Egyptians you'll meet are just the, the, the best people in this world. They're kind, they're generous, they're wonderful. A lot of people say, is it safe to visit Egypt? Of course it is. It's a lot safer than going to London. There you go. I know uh, that I have a downer on London, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just it's a lot. It's down south. It's down yeah, south. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, it is, it is a wonderful now, place. Now, when, when most of us go to exotic places, like if we get the chance and we go to Egypt or Cairo or Valley of the Kings, we, we don't make world headlines, but you tend to. Now, I'm going to take you back to 2003, um, which is um, when you did an expedition there and the, the Discovery Channel did a big program about it. And it's when you suggested that you'd actually found 
um, uh, uh, one of the three mummies found in the walled-up chamber there could could be the mummified body of Nefertiti. Yes. Now, on the back of that, there were huge media coverage, mm. and the uh, it, it didn't go down terribly well with particularly one former head of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities who. Uh, he claimed, well, apparently have, not. he claimed to have banned you from yes, working in well, Egypt. Yes, you're no so, one if you've not been banned from working <laughs> in Egypt. The same so, gentleman banned many far more eminent Egyptologists than, than me. Uh, one of them was banned twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, the, uh, the, fact is that, the fact is, Joe, that, uh, uh, that many other archaeologists leapt to your defence yeah. and came out there and... Uh, and, 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 you know, you, you, you've actually written a chapter of the, of the story there now. So I just wondered, what are your memories of that iron law? And can you tell us, do you believe that the mummy that you found is Nefertiti? Is that a mummified body? All I'm saying to you is the body, the facial measurements, which are unique to all of us, are exact within a millimetre to whoever this lady is. So there's no name on this, but most people would you know, agree this is Nefertiti in the context of the discovery of, of this head and the proportions, the facial proportions, whoever the younger woman is, it's the same as this lady. We are convinced it is Nefertiti and so are some of our critics who at the time were jumping up and down and one or two of them have since claimed they made this discovery. <laughs> How interesting. And I must say, it, for me, I, I can just look back now to 2003 and, uh, and be, be so philosophical simply because it was quite a magical year because everybody's leaping up and down and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I, all of a sudden, I found out I was pregnant and I became a mum, which was probably the best thing that's ever happened other than meeting Stephen. Um, and... Uh, just, it was a, a magical time for me. And of course, the other thing that came out of the so-called Nefertiti project, which again was pure magic, was that we'd taken our digital equipment into the tomb to study all three bodies. And we started to see things in those x-rays that really shouldn't be there. It's like a speckling beneath the skin. Well, the books never tell you about that. And so it was a question of taking our time and deciding what this... this speckling could be and it took eight years of research myself and Stephen mainly Stephen I had my hands full for the, the first few years with uh, the little one um, but yeah after eight years we worked out that not just uh, the younger woman Nefertiti and the other two bodies in that tomb but that whole dynasty Tutankhamun's whole family had been mummified in a completely different way to the one we're always told and so we started experimenting uh, using pig's legs as a human proxy because you can buy them from the supermarket. And so after a while, I got fed up with them being in my kitchen. And so we, we, we uh, relocated the experiments to a garden shed. Um, we then uh, moved up uh, a level to um, piglets because near where we live, lots of farms, lots of piglets die natural deaths and the farmers incinerate them. We said, can we take your dead piglets? They must have thought, these people are bonkers. <laughs> Turning up two people in black for a sack of piglets. <laughs> but we, we knew what we were doing. And then, of course, we were working with the late and very great Professor Don Brothwell, a genius paleopathologist based at York. And he said, if you really want to test this, you need to test it with a human body donor. Well, let me stop you there, because um, I'm going to introduce a gentleman in, in, in a second who was going to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, and um, we're going to talk about how you won the BAFTA for a particular um, TV uh, project. Um, but, but before I do that, just finally, Joe, and, 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 and we've got a lot more to talk about yet to come and in, into the second half, but just in terms of all, everything we've spoken about and the fact that you got the BAFTA award, how does that compare to being awarded the uh, free, uh, what the honorary Freeman of the borough? There is no comparison. <laughs> really? I, I said it um, when I received the freedom. You know, I'm filling up. Study yourself. <laughs> I'm not Piers Morgan. I'm not trying to get you crying. <laughs> but what compares to that? Yeah. You know, like you know, like we, we found out um, a little earlier on, we can stay in anybody's house in Barnsley, and they can't. Yeah, stay. That's thanks to Rita. But can you imagine? Can you imagine having 
your name carved into the stone at the town hall. It's... Well, do you know it, what? Uh, Mind-blowing. Do you know what? I, I felt like big brother um, uh, to you when we, we, you were showing somebody around um, the exhibition recently and you said, can I show you this? And you're so proud of it. You took us to the carving of your name in the Bowsy Town Hall to say that you're there. Well, it, for it, somebody it, that... It matters, yeah, doesn't it? it does, because I spend my life going around ancient temples trying to decipher the hieroglyphs, the cartouches of, of, of pharaohs and the great and the good. And you never think, you know, this could... This, this, it just isn't even on your radar. And when, uh, when you know, Bowsy Council approached me and, 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 and said this was what they'd got planned, but I just, you know, lost, literally lost for words. Yeah. I mean, what on earth could ever top that in terms of, you know, life? No, it's just wonderful, Joe. And we can see your passion. And you talk about it. You know, when, I think people love your TV work so much because you're so passionate and enthusiastic about what you do. And you, 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 you engage with us to feel the same way about the subject matter. Well, it's so important to me. I want people to see ancient Egypt as it really is. How and not brilliant just the pharaohs, it is. but the man in the everybody, street. Everybody, everybody, and yeah. the women, the women in the street there. Sorry, take, <laughs> take talk for But seriously, it means that much because I think here in the West, we look at Greece and Rome as somehow very splendid. And oh yeah, there's Egypt, but they're all a bit strange. It's like, hang on, what's strange about them? Yeah. They're just like you and me. Yeah. Well, look, um, I, it's been an absolute pleasure so far, uh, and I'm sure we're going to have a great second half, but before we have a little comfort break, um, I, I do want to introduce our other special guest tonight, and I can see for every reason why you've got your right soulmate, um, wanting and being interested in, in mummification. I can't think of a, a better expert in the, in the world than the, the gentleman, your partner and colleague, we're going to introduce next. He's an archaeological chemist, I think. Yep. Um, he's also connected very closely, as you are, at York University, where you lecture there as well. And that's, of course, uh, Dr Stephen Buckley. So can we just get Stephen on stage, Stephen? <laughs> Wow, it's yeah. like waiting for a bus, isn't it? And then two of the most <laughs> world-famous archaeologists come along at the same time. Um, Steve, before we uh, uh, talk to him, we're going to talk more in depth in the second half as well, but I just want to say that you've just sat there listening for 50 minutes about Joe's <laughs> No, Neil, there then. <laughs> uh, you've heard it all before, <laughs> I guess. But how enormously proud are you of Joe? And what has she contributed to the world of archaeology and Egyptology? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm massively proud, no question about that. I mean, Joe um, is the Egyptologist that reaches parts of the world that others cannot reach. <laughs> She's the um, but it's absolute, but it's, Egyptology. it's absolutely true. I mean, um, we share an email address. Um, it's convenient, and I'm sort of a bit of an electronic bodyguard. But the significance of that is we get emails every few days, if not more often, um, from all over the world saying how uh, brilliant Jo is and how they've inspired, how she's inspired them. Um, and the latest was today from um, a bloke from uh, Florida um, just saying how wonderful Jo is. And um, from all over the world, from every continent, um, and it never stops. And it must be into the thousands, certainly the many hundreds of emails that we've had over the years, uh, saying how she's inspired them. So again, to pinch Joe's words to some extent, um, she democratizes Egyptology, because it can be a very elitist subject. Yeah. Um, and Joe's anything but that. Um, so if you- I don't know how to take that. No. <laughs> Well, I'm, go I'm, going to say, I'm going to say something else. It's actually Joe's passion yeah. and ordinariness, if you like, her approachability that actually makes her so special. Yeah, I, I, I think you've summed that up lovely. Uh, uh, what we don't really get to see is uh, Joe as a mum and a wife. And uh, what, what's the family routine like? I mean, how special is she's part <laughs> <Chaotic>. of that? <laughs> 
Yes, it's not. Uh, it, it, it's different, I suppose. Um, <laughs> Shall the, we stop there? The, the, three of us, the three of us are free spirits, yeah. uh, without doubt. So um, I do burn a lot of dinners. I love to cook, but if, if I'm in library or office and something, I, I find a, a reference I've been looking for, and then it was like last week, a daughter came in. Mom, mom, something's burning. There's smoke everywhere. Oh, we had to have all the windows open. I'd, I'd burnt dinner again. <laughs> but, but one day, you know, each day's different. It's never the same. Yeah. So it, how, how, did you, how did you both meet, just out of interest? Oh, at, that, was, um, that was brilliant. At Le Leeds Art Gallery. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I was saying... I'm sorry I'm interrupting. Yeah, you've no, only just come on, love. Sorry. It's, all, it's all right, Jim. Yeah. It's, it, it's used to it. I, I was, you know, when I'd finished my PhD, I moved back to Yorkshire and I was so fed up of always having to go to London for every flipping event. So I thought, right, we're going we're gonna to put events on up in Yorkshire and they can come to us. Uh, and the very first one was called Reviving the Mummy and that was in Leeds Museum and Art Gallery. And uh, a certain Dr Stephen Buckley turned up and asked me a question about the resin used in embalming. I thought, oh, hello. Um, <laughs> I've met the man of my dreams, I bet that's really... I thought, what a chat-up line, tell me about this <laughs> resin. I mean, can't beat it. <laughs> I suspect very few have had the same, uh, the same uh, introduction yet, so... But um, it, it and, then and then from there, it, 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 we, it was just a quick... It took us a little while to um, end up in the same place, but it was, again, mummies brought us together. There's no question of that. Yeah. Um, so a talk in Lincolnshire and then um, a Bloomsbury um, event yeah, that, that, that Joe was, was, was part of organising. It, it must be terrific as well that you both are so passionate about the field that you work in. That you, I get you, you two guys never switch off, do you? Never. I bet when you're at home in Scarborough there, you, many an evening goes by talking oh, about yeah. mummification. Yeah, be watching telly and something will strike. You go, oh, what about that? So so. And the great thing is, not being a scientist myself, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I try, but I'm not. Um, but I have no. Obviously, I have no nervousness asking Stephen the most daft scientific question because he, he, with a lot of scientists that you know they got the white coats on and you're a bit, you know, daunted by them because they're they're a bit intimidating. So you think, well, I can't ask them that question; they'll think I'm daft. But we have such a, a dialogue, yeah. and, and I it's think, brilliant. Yeah. And I it? think that's why it works well because uh, we complement each other. Um, but also, like Joe, I'm quite happy to ask stupid questions about the history and the Egyptology and the archaeology. You have to, you have to ask the stupid questions. And that's, so that and that's how we learn. Sometimes. That's how we learn. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, we're going to talk more about your, your, your career and your careers together and some of the amazing things you've done, like winning the BAFTA, um, making mummies talk after 3,000 years, um, and, uh, and even looking for um, um, mummies in paintings, which is an interesting one. Bizarrely, but we're going to get there. But before we just take a little interval, um, I do need to ask you, Steve, about something that you've just actually been making big headlines about. You recently came up with the recipe of literally how to make a mummy, um, uh, looking at natural ingredients, and, 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 and now that I've been discovered, the, 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 the recipe had been discovered on pots and in, 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 in an excavation that you were involved in. Um, now, it's got huge significance as well because it shows a lot of those ingredients come from very far away places. It shows the scale of ancient Egypt like never before. Very significant piece of work. Can you just explain that a little bit to us? Yeah, sure. It was a privilege to be part of that. Um, and as you're saying, I, I was actually there at the mummification workshop. It's the first that's been found ever. Um, and it showed us where some of the processes took place, which we've never had before, uh, but also a lot of pots with, uh, that contain the ingredients, the embalming ingredients that were crucial in preserving um, the bodies. And through chemical analysis, which is my main thing, um, we actually worked out that there were these exotic recipes, but some of these ingredients, these resins, these trees of resins, were coming huge distances. So we knew that the ancient Egyptians imported from uh, the Near East, Lebanon, uh, Biblos, uh, but some of these were coming from um, Southeast Asia, so certainly as far as India and beyond. Um, so um, they were really going to uh, great effort to, uh, to get these ingredients 
Um, they clearly had ingredients that were quite effective that were closer to home, but there was certainly clearly an amount of uh, a certain amount of um, kudos involved, if you like, uh, getting them from further away. So it was also a sort of a, a statement of status as well, if you could afford to get these ingredients from from uh, so far away. So it's really showing that the Egyptian world was much larger than uh, many um, uh, have believed, really. And the type of ingredients that we use then to, to mix with the linens and everything to actually make a mummy, what, 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 what are we talking about, Steve? Yeah, I mean, they were very clever because they, were used, they used these mixtures that had antibacterial and an antifungal properties, um, uh, but also mixed with more mundane things, if you like, like fats and oils that were actually used quite often for purposes of identity. So they'd actually use some of these fats that connected with certain gods, deities, for example. Um, so it wasn't just about preservation. It was also about associating with their religious deities, uh, but also saying something about who they, they thought they were as well. So quite interesting in that respect. And, uh, and they were using these antibacterials in and on the body and then barrier materials on the external wrapping. So again... Um, these were the embalmers were very clever in terms of understanding the science, certainly empirically, um, being um, really skillful practicing chemists, which is quite nice from my point of view. And I believe some of the pots actually said apply this ear or wherever yes. it was on the body, so you actually got to know how it was actually created. That was a nice part of it, yeah. The pots actually said what they were, what these ingredients were actually for, whether it was applying it to the head or. And what uh, kind of ingredients are we talking about? What kind of fruits or... Um, um, a lot of them were tree resins, yes. so, so conifer, cedar, um, cedar and pine, um, and also a um, bit obscure, but elemi resin and dama resin, which again have antibacterial properties. And, and has this actually now changed the history books again in terms of what we know about the subject matter? Yeah, yeah, I mean it was published in the world's number one science journal, Nature, um, and um, it, um, it made quite a big impact. It, it's really um, forcing a, a greater understanding of, of the ingredients uh, that were used and also showing that these were uh, skillful uh, embalmers that knew the properties of the ingredients they were using. Um, so it wasn't just esoteric, it wasn't just throwing um, natural products on for symbolic reasons. It was... Um, using materials that would uh, produce some fantastic preservation if used uh, in the right hands. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, well, listen, I don't know about you guys, but I've just loved that. I don't know where that hour's just gone by. I'm thinking we've got another hour left, or the best part of it. I think we could do with another two hours, to be honest with you. And I can already see part two coming later this year. But for now, uh, we're going to take a very, very quick comfort break for about 10 minutes. So um, if you want to make the most of that, but please, if you could be back in your seats within 10 minutes, because we do need to press on. Joe, stay thanks to you. back to our second half of a, an audience with Joe and Steve and I, I think you all admit it's been absolutely fascinating the first half and we've got more of that to come. Uh, but before we, we get um, uh, started with it again, um, I, I, I'd just like to say that um, obviously this has uh, been uh, uh, part of the Barnes & Museum's Took 22 uh, campaign that actually ends on Saturday as we, we heard earlier. Um, but you know what, life goes on, and um, there's a next exhibition that's coming, and I think we've got a poster that we can put up on uh, to show you about it, and, and it's the Tailor Made in Barnsley, which is a, an exhibition about uh, linen, uh, and the, um, which we, we were laughing about, because what do they make mummies with? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> um, So uh, we've got that coming in the temporary space at Experience Barnsley from 1st of April through to the um, uh, 16th of September. 
So please go along, please support it. There's lots more great things coming. I think on the back of linen and fashion, I think there's even a, a, an event coming up at Cannon Hall, which is some kind of catwalk event as well. Um, but we'll be finding out more about all that, a, a photo exhibition and various other things. So please look out for all that. Um, and then also I just want to give another name check to um, Barnsley College for hosting tonight's event in this fantastic space. I'm sure we'll be back and doing more of these kind of things in future as well. Um, but Barnsley College does say, Barnsley Sixth Form College does say it is more than a college. And here's a little show reel, a little video to show you what they're doing here at Barnsley College. And uh, yeah, great to see uh, what's happening here at Barnsley College these days. And Joe, I suppose things have changed a little bit since when you were at Barnsley College. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Although the, the fashion uh, students were brilliant. On our last Egyptian exhibition, we worked with them and they produced this amazing collection of Egypt-inspired uh, clothes that were then um, shown at, at the Great Yorkshire show, I think, yeah. was it 2016, 2017, they had a catwalk show. Absolutely brilliant students, you yeah. know, real credit to the college. Yeah, yeah, and again, I'm really looking forward to the exhibition that um, uh, is going to be booting me out of your space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come first in yeah, April. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, but you know what the nice thing is, as we've said, and as we saw earlier, that the virtual exhibition will always be there, which is going to be a great yeah. legacy, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a lovely thing to have. So, um, Steve, um, uh, we, we introduced you just before the end of the second half. We were talking about uh, you made uh, world headlines um, recently, but you're always in the news, and I love to see you in that white smoke. I think um, I think you and the guy from Back to the Future, my two favourite mad scientists. <laughs> <laughs> and here's something where I thought you were absolutely crazy, but uh, it, it just this story has fascinated me. So we've got a little uh, uh, news clip here that we're going to show about how you were looking for mummies in paintings in Cannon Hall. Halloween visitors to a new Resurrecting Ancient Egypt exhibition at Cannon Hall Museum near Barnsley are in for a spooktacular surprise. Scientists believe they are about to discover real mummy remains in paintings hung on the walls, as archaeological chemist Dr Stephen Buckley has been telling us. Yeah, we're here at Cannon Hall with uh, an ancient Egyptian exhibition on at the moment, uh, photography, the architecture. But what's uh, really excellent from my point of view is that we've actually got uh, mummies here as well, actually in the paintings, bizarre as it sounds. It may seem strange to us now, but the, uh, the paint mummy brown was used widely, um, could actually be bought just as any other colour of paint. Uh, and it was literally ground up uh, Egyptian mummies uh, with this rich brown colour uh, that was used in paintings, particularly pre raphaelite paintings. And the great uh, artists of the time, late 19th century, were using this paint, um, often unknowingly, uh, but actually using Egyptian mummies, as I say, to create these beautiful works of art. Until the very early 20th century, around 1905, you could still get 
uh, mummy brown paint, you could still buy it. Uh, adverts in the Daily Mail. This painting that's behind me now, it's an example of what's likely to be the use of mummy brown and what's interesting to me is that uh, where the colour is being used it's, is actually um, on the Grim Reaper. So given the ancient Egyptian connection with death and mummies, then um, that is quite a nice uh, uh, twist really for me. What, we, what I really take is a forensic approach to um, the analysis of these paints. Um, and one of the aspects of that is to use tiny, tiny samples um, that you can barely see and we're able to determine the composition of the paints used using uh, the latest scientific technology. So it has no uh, impact on the painting itself. Now, Steve, you did say that you could buy mummy brown paint. I went out and bought some this week. So here we go, some mummy brown paint. Um, now, I, I am told that there's no uh, pharaohs in that. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> anymore. not now, that's right. Uh, so, yeah, just tell, I mean, what an amazing story! How do you how do you come across things like this? And 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 obviously, I suppose that you're trying to captivate people's imaginations as well. But a real a real piece of history behind that. Can you just a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not something we would do now, obviously, but um, but it, it sort of fits and makes sense. Uh, and here, sort of, is an example, by the way, of um, the uh, sample. Um, where we, yeah, that, that is real mummy brown yeah, paint with just, fair rows inside it. But we only need very tiny oh, samples. It's the mixture. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I'm going to have to wash my hands now, aren't I? Mm -hmm. yes. But it's the sample size, the size of a pinhead. Yeah. But actually, my, my PhD uh, external examiner was uh, Raymond White, and he was actually the principal scientific officer at the National Gallery in London, where his job was actually to take tiny, tiny samples from these brilliant paintings the old, the old masters produced um, and tried to identify the ingredients. And there is a connection, which is why he ended up being my external examiner, because um, the same sort of ingredients that the old masters were using, the resins, the oils, the waxes, were the same sort of ingredients that the Egyptian embalmers, embalmers were using to uh, embalm um, their dead. Um, so there is sort of a, a logical connection there, if you like, um, that the old masters recognised that within Mummy Brown um, were um, substances with the qualities that they wanted for their paintings. Um, and clearly at that time, we were quite comfortable using that. Uh, yeah. But from my point of view, it's interesting to sort of see the comparison. So but the fact that the mummy remains were actually being crushed and put into paint like this, I mean, yeah. it must have been on, they must have been bringing mummies back to the UK uh, on an industrial they scale. Did. They, they were. Did. Yeah. Animal mummies as yeah. well. I mean, there are news reports of cat mummies being brought into the docks in Liverpool and sold by the ton. Because the Egyptians well. were mummifying animals. It was, a, it was a, on an industrial in millions, scale yeah. in their millions. And just think how much history that we've lost through through all this and yet people didn't mind and certainly in Victorian Britain when we're just dealing with those Egyptians from the Bible who, who were worshipping you know pagan gods anyway what did it matter almost that you, you did have that mindset as if as if you know their their remains were somehow less important than those who'd been given a proper what, Christian what burial. What kind of string, stringent Crazy. controls have been put on exporting anything out of Egypt these days Joe? You can't. Nothing can be taken out of the country. It's uh, it all stays in Egypt. And quite interestingly, something like the, the famed Nefertiti bust that's in in Berlin, isn't it? In the that's museum. in Berlin, yes. And there's, a, there's an infamous picture of Adolf Hitler actually holding that bust as well. Well, I mean, it, it she was got... discovered in 1912, um, and ended up in Berlin Museum. And Adolf Hitler is on record when it was uh, you know overtures were made. Can we have Nefertiti back, please? And he said, what the German people have, the German people keep. Mm. Is that right? Do you think that we should still have artefacts here or, and share them so more people can see them? I think, should they go back? I think, given... I'll be very interested to see how technology develops in terms of if we can replicate this. It's the same argument with the algae marbles as for and against... Should they stay here? Should they go back? The Rosetta Stone, perhaps? The Rosetta Stone, for sure. That's another very contentious issue. 
What I would say when it comes to smaller items that, you know, little shabty figures, scarabs of which there are many million, I think there's a, a great deal to be said for having them in local collections, museum collections, to inspire Egyptologists of the future to also um, it's like it's like having things in our museum here in Barnsley for local children to come and see these things and be inspired and to learn about our region's past. As but part technology of the is whole certainly taking us closer to it, yeah, isn't it? It okay, absolutely it is. is. I mean, when we we're able to almost it's like Star Trek beam down to and Carmen's master and Cairo Museum into the heart of Barnsley Town Hall. We've yeah, got the object with us, you know. It? Yeah, quite remarkable. Um, and see, um, in terms of technology, it allows you to do things that we wouldn't even a few years have thought were possible. Now, the next um, uh, uh, story that I want to bring in, in terms of what you did, you actually made a, um, a mummy to speak again for the first time in 3,000 years. Now, this is, sounds quite remarkable. Um, and before, before we, we talk about that, um, I, I, we, we have got um, a little bit of footage that I'm, I can show, I think, just to, again, just to put it in perspective. You've just been listening to an incredible world first, the sound of an ancient Egyptian mummy speaking for the first time in more than 3,000 years after amazing new scientific work beginning in Yorkshire. Experts from the universities of York and London have created a 3D print of the mummy's voice box attached an electronic larynx and produced a sound like the vowels in the English words bed and bad. Next phase of the so-called Voices from the Past project, headed by Yorkshire Professor John Schofield, is to produce complete words and sentences. The voice belongs to Nessie Amon, also known as the Leeds Mummy, a priest, incense bearer and scribe at the time of Ramesses XI from the ancient state temple of Karnak in Thebes or modern Luxor. He died in his mid-fifties around 1100 BC. The mummy had severely worn protruding teeth which will also impact on the way he talked and unusually for an Egyptian mummy his tongue still protrudes. Nessie Amon's remains, since 1823 held at Leeds City Museum, were well preserved as a result of the mummification process. Experts took CT scans at Leeds General Infirmary and the 3D print of his vocal tract was created by Professor David Howard, former head of the Electronics Department at the University of York, now head of Electronic Engineering at Royal Holloway University of London. The process is already used medically to provide authentic vocal sounds for patients who have lost normal speech function following an accident or surgery for the likes of laryngeal cancer. BBC TV Egyptologist Professor Joan Fletcher and her partner, archaeological chemist and mummification expert Dr Stephen Buckley, both of University of York, are a key part of the team. Barnsley-born Professor Fletcher said Nessie Amun's wish to speak after his death was now coming true after more than 3,000 years. She told how a fundamental Egyptian belief was to speak the name of the dead to make them live again and Nessie Amun's coffin inscriptions included the frequent repetition of his name and the term Nessie Amun, true of voice. Now it, it did say, Jill, that uh, that's to be continued and um, I just wondered, um, and Steve, what, what the plans are. Um, I, I mean we heard a voice that sounded a little bit like a sheep to be honest with you, but, it, it, but we, got, we got the idea. Would it, would it be possible to actually have a few words and sentences and, and could that happen? I think ultimately with the trajectory of the, the speed at which the, the technology is advancing, I mean what, what David Howard, Professor David Howard's electronic magic was able to do was give him his authentic vocal sound. But when it comes to actually enunciating speaking words, that will take several more years of, of work. We're actually, we've been speaking to, um, shall we say, uh, certain colleagues only last week wasn't it and again next week yeah. uh, on uh, the next step in this uh, process we've got some people who are very keen to collaborate with us um, and for us it's important to realize that this is Nezia Moon this this priest that, that died you know 3,000 years ago he repeats on his coffin inscriptions that he wants to be able to speak again in the next world he wants to be able to address the gods as he did in his daily life. His name, Nezia Moon, is written with the sign of a tongue. And at the end of it, 
his epithet is uh, truer voice, Nazir Moon, truer voice. And I really think that this is a fascinating project with huge potential because for me, speaking personally, there's a tendency for people to visit museums, see mummies and see them as, quote, objects. These are not. These are living, once living individuals as real as you or I. So I think to hear a vocal sound unique to it, we've, we've all got our unique voices, unique to each of us, they're like a fingerprint. Um, and to be able to recreate that for these individuals so people can see them as well as hear them when they visit a museum and all of a sudden people then realise humans just like us. There's not that detachment that they can be if they're just there row upon yeah. row and all very anonymous. It's uh, this this project is it's something that that really inspires us because it's it's getting us that little bit closer. Yeah. And, and what came out w was the first step yeah. which I think was missed by a lot of people because as you say the sound well d doesn't sound like much in some ways but the point is speaking as a scientist a lot of science is not easy. And it takes time, and to, it, it, it's a stepwise process. And so, so this was the first step, um, and a crucial one, and a crucial one in terms of getting funding and further research, and uh, and the funding to actually uh, be able to create what we need to take that further. And which, I think which will also yeah, ultimately that's, include. That's the thing. That's the key, though. I mean, yeah. people often say to me and Stephen, "Oh, you're very slow in your work, aren't you?" Our contribution to this project was done in our own time. The length, the time it takes to write a scientific paper takes months and months and months, and we do it in our own time. So we're spinning all these plates on sticks, all these projects, the vast majority in our own time. We must be crazy, but we love it so, so if much. We, if we've waited 3,000 years, we can wait a few more Exactly. Months, That's we? just what I think, Graham. <laughs> and, it's, and it's not just about the science. It's also about <laughs> engaging... Egyptian Egyptologists who know the text, and we've been working with someone. Very lucky to work with, with yeah, for an over Egyptian a colleague um, who's an absolutely brilliant linguist. Yeah. Um, conveniently, he's from Giza, but he's conveniently based in Leeds. Dr. Mohammed Soliman is a great colleague, um, and to sort of take this project further. Um, with him would be phenomenal. I, I guess yes. the thing is as well, I mean, it did send a shiver down my spine though when you explained the backstory about how he wanted to speak in the next life and technically that's what is now happening, isn't yes, it? Yes, but also it again comes back to Yorkshire because this mummy was the first mummy, mummified body anywhere on planet Earth to be scientifically, scientifically studied by a, a group of specialists. In a, in a proper environment. So he came to Leeds in 1823. In 1824, he was studied by a team of Yorkshire scientists, doctors, chemists, etc. The findings were published in 1828, so that's a flag in the sand. Once again, Yorkshire at the forefront of this aspect of Egyptological study. So what we're doing is simply continuing with that pioneering legacy, really. It's important, I suppose, Steve, as well, that you actually treat, as Joe said, these mummies with dig dignity because Always. we're talking about Always. real people yeah um, you did another piece of work recently where you proved that the mummification process was probably 2,000 years before we thought it actually begun 6,000 years ago when it first started which is just absolutely incredible um, but I want to get round to the reason why you, why you've got the BAFTA here tonight and that's the mummifying Alan uh, TV documentary that you did that um, I, I guess most people in the room watching online will be familiar with it. But, Steve, can you just explain what you did and why you did it? Yeah, yeah. As Joe said, it, it went back to the 2003 uh, Search for Nefertiti project, where it was looking at these three mummies. And we saw something that uh, was unusual, and we, we didn't really expect this, this snowflake uh, effect, to use uh, Professor Don Brothwell's term. Um, which was basically crystals of salt within the tissue that shouldn't have been there. Um, and up until that point, Joe and myself were quite happy to go along with the received wisdom, the view that uh, uh, mummies were produced by piling on the dry natron and the salt, water, yeah. the, 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 the uh, natron salt, um, to dry out the body. And um, removing the water, stopping the decay, and that was it. And we were, and then applying the embalming resins. Uh, in that order, 
and that seemed reasonable at the time. Uh, but it was quite clear that that was utterly wrong. And so um, our understanding of when Egyptian mummification was at its peak, um, during the time of Tutankhamun, although he wasn't particularly great, but people around him, his family, were brilliantly preserved. And so um, it was clear that um, we'd missed something very significant. And so... Um, I was lucky enough to have some very obscure papers by a brilliant chemist, Alfred Lucas, and by comparing the x-rays where the ones where you saw these, the snow, these snowflakes um, between the skin and the bone of the arms and, and the legs, um, you also had what was called combined natrons. And basically this meant that uh, clearly they were putting these bodies in a natron salt solution. Why that mattered was because for decades there'd been an argument that no, you couldn't preserve an Egyptian mummy in a salt solution. It would fall to pieces, the hair would come out, the nails would fall off, and it just wouldn't work. Um, and yet this chem chemistry showed that clearly it did. Um, ironically, this chemist convinced himself he was wrong, and it could only be dry natron. Um, but... Um, we realised there was something quite special here, so it was a question of doing the experiments, uh, starting with pigs, pigs trotters, as Joe said, actually um, on Christmas Eve, two thousand and four, in, 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 in the kitchen. That's yeah, true, uh, <laughs> and then carried them on into the shed, shed as, as yes. Joe has said. Um, but it was quite clear that this was fundamental uh, because um, it suggested you could, but a body in a salt solution and perfectly preserved, that was the point. And so with the pig experiments, uh, we showed using the piglets ultimately that had been sadly killed by the mums rolling over on them, which is quite common, um, that you could get perfect, fantastic preservation. Um, before and afterwards, just the same, using this um, natron salt solution. And um, so this is very significant for Egyptology, given the controversy for 150 years there'd be. Uh, and as Joe has already said, Don Brothwell said, you really need to do a, a human. And so um, that wasn't going to be easy, but we had, <laughs> no, we, had the, I can't imagine. we had the inspector of anatomy, as it was then, on our side. And then it became the Human Tissue Authority. And they were also on our side and the British Medical Association. So we had a lot of supporters. But it was clearly, clearly quite difficult because um, legally donating for medical science, that's too vague for a lot of things, actually. So any, anyway, in the end, we um, after a lot of attempts um, to go through more straightforward routes, if you like, it ended up with being an advert by um, Channel 4 for a, a body donor. And it has to be said that Channel 4 is known for some brilliant programmes and uh, some absolute nonsense as well. Um, so it's interesting that Alan was the only person who came forward. So Sit let's just get let's just get this right. So you ended up mummifying a taxi driver yeah. called Alan in Sheffield. Yeah. That was and that was the key to it. Sheffield has the most incredible place, the Medico Legal Centre, the staff there are Phenomenal. This is where the inquest and, and yeah, things yeah, are. Yeah, and, and yeah. they were brilliant. And they were convinced. And, and they, they, they supported important. us all the way. We've learned so much from them. This brilliant team that, that are just experts in, in, in human remains. So did Alan just give you a call one day and say, I want you to mummify me? Oh, pretty much. Yes, I mean. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> um, and, and he was clearly a brilliant character. Yeah, um, You know, was very much someone who would think, why not? Um, and so uh, it was a privilege to that he yeah. was part and of it. And you got to know him and his family. His family, yeah, absolutely. His family, yeah. 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 I, would have, I, I would have happily, I'm just only speaking myself, but I would, would have happily uh, gone out with him for a drink, yeah. got pissed, um, <laughs> and then still done, and then obviously, so once sobered up, would have done the, the experiment I ultimately did on him. Sadly, he died before that was a possibility. Mm. 
Um, but um, he was such a brilliant character. And, uh, and his family's yeah, lovely as well. I would as have Widow. been utterly comfortable with that. Uh, was it, what, what, was it, well. I mean, obviously your idea, but was it a big team that was involved behind this as indeed with a lot of projects? We had a, yeah. a brilliant pathologist working yeah. with us, a home office pathologist, uh, Professor Peter Venesis, who's amazing. Uh, Maxine Coe at the Medical Legal Centre and her colleagues, just, just some incredible So the people. team was, yeah, the, yeah, team, the team was team fantastic. Was and how, how, how long ago is this now? Because time... Uh, 2011. Oh. Um, uh, so more than 10 years, well... Ten, just over, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the question is, how is Alan? Where is he? And Alan's is that great. story continue? Yes. Alan's, Alan's great. He's doing um, well, yeah. Uh, we had a party uh, where he is now the uh, it's the Gordon Museum of Pathology again whose whose staff are incredible and it's the uh, UK's oldest medical uh, museum. Um, so where is this? It's that's been moved now. King's from College, yeah. yeah. King's, King's College, College, London, London yeah. um, which also is part of St Thomas's and Guy's Hospital. Yeah. It's a place for medical and students. He's used in the teaching as well. Yeah. So he, the, he is part of that. Is the teaching. idea to keep inspecting on to yes. see yeah. how yeah. Yeah. he has his own part of the the museum um, and his body's in the the glass tank in which he was submerged and it's now the display tank it's not a museum open to the public but you can go if you apply and you're going you know, and, and after right 10 reasons. years how's the mummification process working fantastic I mean it, it takes at least 10 years for the salt crystals to grow anything like they do I mean obviously in ancient Egyptian mummified remains they've had three and a half thousand years so Alan needs a little bit longer but the party was great and his, his widow was there his daughter her children and his widow said he would have loved this. He would have, well, you know. I'm guessing that this this story will continue yes, long after we've gone. Oh, a long, yeah. long, long time. So his body will be studied for and he wanted centuries. It, he, he wanted this project to be his legacy for his grandchildren, and I think that's you know it's an incredible thing. Yeah, I suppose yeah. the the question that comes from that as well, um, and and let's remind everybody that you you beat David Attenborough that year to actually get the uh, the bathroom. In fact, come on, you've got to. And Brian, and Brian Cox as well. Just... I, I, only, I only say Brian Cox as well because our daughter actually. Um, she cried. She when cried Brian Cox didn't because win. Brian we Cox won. didn't win. Exactly. Yeah. Flipping out. Yeah. Brian Cox to yeah. Win. But like on the back of that, and the legacy on the back of that now, um, have you had other people who've asked yeah. if you could mummify yeah. them? And waiting list, is it 20? 23 now. 23 people. So we'll you have a waiting list. So, yeah. so we must have got something to? right. Well, we yeah. need the facilities. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've got the shed in the garden, but that's but not from one, concept, is it? <laughs> but from only Alan coming forward to 23, yeah. so we clearly uh, did something I've right. got to ask, as well as morbid as this might be, that God forbid it happens for an, at least another 50 or 60 years, but what's going to happen to you two? Well, if I pop off first, he's mummifying me. <laughs> another exclusive, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I think the one great thing to say, though, there had been, uh, when the, the programme aired, in all seriousness, the whole point of this was there was a significant rise in people wanting to donate their bodies for medical and archaeological research. So for us, yeah. that is very, very important. This isn't just a piece of, you know... It captures darkness. people's imaginations, though, Joe. Yeah, it does, but it's, it's got this really... Things. Yeah, it does, and it's, it's yeah. got serious benefits. Yeah. The ancient Egyptians developed a form of preserving skin, soft tissue, that can maybe now be rolled out in, in modern medicine because the current uh, formalin, formaldehyde, is carcinogenic. The ancient Egyptians had developed something much cheaper, much easier, much more straightforward three and a half thousand years ago. So yet again, the ancient Egyptians are shown as the way forward. And when you use the salt solution, then the feel of the body um, is just as a normal um, donated body would be. So in terms of students learning, then yeah. um, it, it would... Um, work perfectly and as Joe said be uh, again, safer than formerly. Again Steve I guess rewriting the history books which is wonderful. Now you're passing that award yeah. back but I want to pass another one to you as well. Tell us about that Joe. What's oh, yeah. that about? Well that came before the BAFTA for the very same thing that's the Royal Television Society Award. Again it was Oz Brown Cox and David Attenborough. So we got this one then we got that one and then we got the Association for International Broadcasting Award as well and we've had some other bits and pieces but it's it's like as mantelpiece looks all right, but I've got pass. Can you pass me oh, the one yes, in the middle? Of yeah. Oh, the most special one of the, all. Yeah, totally special. This one. This is a, a Pride of Barnsley Award. 
<laughs> so. <laughs> Brilliant. Special. Absolutely fantastic. Well, look, we, we've we've spoken about the career, uh, but, but there's a lot to come yet. Um, oh, I, and yeah. I want to yeah. just ask you what we can, what we can't talk about. Um, um, there are some amazing things that I know are going off in the background. But um, Joe, can you tell us? I know that the, 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 the you're doing work with uh, TV and movie uh, companies, where you've been consultant on some big projects. And there's even uh, a computer game that if we talked about tonight, I think they'd have, have to kill us. Yes. So we can't we give can. much away yet, but that's coming soon. But yeah. what can you tell us? What is happening? And, and when are you going back to Egypt? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I should have been in Egypt last month uh, and I've put it off and it might be next month because I'm working with a, a wonderful lady uh, called Lydia in Cairo. And um, she's a, a force of nature, is Lydia. And we've got a lot of plans. She came over to uh, England to see me after many Zoom calls. And, of course, I met her in London, but I said, you know, it's all well and good, but you really need to come somewhere really special. So we, we got the train up to Barnsley. She loved the exhibition here. She really did. Um, I think she's our furthest visitor we've had. She's not only a furthest visitor, but she's actually watching the live stream tonight. And she's just put a comment up, Joe, Bless saying... Her. That listening to uh, Joe uh, tonight, and as always, makes me very proud to be an Egyptian. Which is lovely, isn't it? You've set me off again. <laughs> that's lovely. But she's a great lady, a great lady. But that's that's the joy of this job. You meet people like this, and you know you, you have you have dinner with them and a drink, and 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 talk about the possibilities, the work we can do together. It's it's so exciting. It's it's wonderful, and our colleague Mark over in Barcelona. Um, oh, another was over for, he came for the launch. He didn't came. He? We've, we've had Mark at the beginning of the exhibition, and Lydia at the end of the exhibition. These wonderful people. So you will be working yeah. with these people going forward. Yeah, and, and we've uh, got some big, big plans. And a big plan to go back to Egypt very soon. Yeah, 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 yeah excellent. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the other things, like you know, obviously, like I say, I know that there's a certain amount that we can't talk about, but things like even cosmetics and getting involved in the world of yeah. des design and fashion, it, it throws up just so many ways forward, doesn't it, in Absolutely. terms of what we're going to see Absolutely. from Absolutely. Well, in the same way, to be able to not just see uh, an ancient Egyptian, but to hear an ancient Egyptian. And I'm very passionate about one of my great uh, passions in life, um, this whole idea of perfumes and how brilliant the ancient Egyptians were at distilling and creating signature fragrances for some of the, the, the big names, you know, some of the uh, fam most famous pharaohs had their own signature smell, as it were, and to be able to recreate that. Mm. And then can you imagine that immersive experience of going into a museum and every box is ticked? You're not just looking at ancient Egypt, you're immersing yourself in their world and it's as close as we'll ever get to a time machine, and that's something I really want to do. I really want to do that. And anybody wanting to follow your story going forward as well can follow you all over social media, and there's going to be more. I know that you've just launched Instagram as well, and you're on YouTube Yeah, I've just, I've just got to learn how to use it. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if uh, people want to check you out as well on your brand new website that yeah. went live today, it's called... Uh, Immortal Egypt. Dot co dot UK. Dot co dot UK. <laughs> So if you want to check that out, and I'm sure you're going to be blogging on there, there's going to be lots yeah. of other information, yeah. which is just terrific. And like I've said, some of this other, other great work that's coming up soon, you'll find all about it there. No doubt you will be coming back to Barnsley to do more work as well. I hope so. We, 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 <laughs> one of your proudest um, um, discoveries wasn't in Cairo at all. It was in Darfield. Darfield. Tell me about Obviously. that. Obviously. That was phenomenal. There's been a running joke that I wouldn't be happy until I'd proved Cleopatra came from Barnsley. <laughs> I thought, yeah, well, just leave it with me. Uh, and, of course, when we got our beautiful new museum in 2013, um, that's when a lot of the material that had been found archaeologically right around the borough started to come back from places like Doncaster Museum, who'd been storing it for us, Sheffield Museum, etc., uh, and I remember going through this material before it was put on display at our new museum here, beautiful new museum, um, Roman coins from Darfield. And I started researching the backstory of multiple coin hoards found in pots when they were building this housing estate on the Doncaster Road between Barnsley and Doncaster. 
in the middle of Darfield. Um, and some of the earliest coins, I remember pulling them out and looking at them, I nearly fainted. Silver coins minted by Mark Antony and his missus, Cleopatra, <laughs> to pay the troops that fought for them at the Battle of Actium. And they even had Cleopatra's warships on the front of them and Antony's standards on the other side. And to think these had made it all the way um, across the Roman Empire, to not just to Roman Britain, but to Roman Barnsley, Roman Darfield. So that's incredible. Uh, and because you can see some of these coins in the permanent exhibition yes, that experienced Barnsley absolutely, as well. So absolutely. It's all, yeah. And it's sort of it set off a real project in our heads that we want to take forward as well, because Darfield has not received the recognition it deserves as a major trading point in the Roman world. It's quite clearly there. You know, you've got the confluence of the, the River Dove, the River Dern, like, you know, when the Romans founded York, Ibaracum, on the confluence of two rivers, the Foss and the Ouse, and it's exactly the same technique that they were using in Darfield. So right be beneath our feet in Darfield, we've got aspects of the Roman Empire that bring in aspects uh, well, of Egypt we, too. We, we actually um, had a discussion at one point about how you think that mummies could even be found by Absolutely. the Because as the Romans conquered and they brought traditions yes. and cultures with them. They brought, the, well, by the, by the time the Romans conquered Britain, they'd already uh, taken over Egypt, but Egypt had taken over them. They began to worship the gods of Egypt. And as they moved and conquered right across their empire, they took the gods of Egypt with them. The furthest, most northerly Egyptian temple ever built, and we're talking a stone temple here, um, in, in, in the entire ancient world was in Yorkshire, on the banks of the River Ouse in York. Mm -hmm. They were worshipping Egyptian deities 2,000 years ago. The great goddess Isis, a part of her worship, was at death. She will give you eternal life if you are embalmed and mummified. So what did they do? They started embalming, wrapping in linen, but... You know, different climate here to Egypt. And so they were coating in plaster, gypsum plaster, to make these mummified bodies watertight. And these have been found right across Rome and Britain, but the majority are found in Yorkshire. Honestly, I'm not making this up. Uh, and you can see their distribution right across uh, our part of the world, very close to Barnsley, in fact. Um, so it will be intriguing to do more work on that too. Well, you know, absolutely fascinating. Watch this space. Always something interesting coming your way. And like I so said, now you've got immortalegypt.co.uk. That's another plug from it. Excellent. You'll be a lot of information there. And in fact, um, just to remind you all the virtual tour we saw earlier, I think that's embedded at, at, on your site as well. If people want to go on there, they'll, they'll be able to find it. Now, we're going to go into some Q&As next, uh, just to finish uh, the session. We've just got one other thing that we need to do. Um, we've got um, a real fun question for all of you. It's a special quiz question uh, that um, we got somebody rather special to ask earlier this week. Hello, folks. Sean Wallace here. I hope you're having a great night with the TB Egyptologists Joanne Fletcher and Stephen Buckley. I'm a huge fan of all things ancient Egypt. So how about a quiz question for you all? In what year was the Egyptian hieroglyph code cracked by the French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion? Was it A, 1722, B, 1822, or C, 1922? The answer is B, 1822. The 200th anniversary was celebrated recently at the British Museum. If you love quizzes, join me to be a part of an official world record bid. I'm presenting the Swizzle's world biggest ever quiz with our host, Martin Kemp, at the Utility Arena Sheffield on Sunday, the 18th of June at 4 p.m. We need more than 5,000 of you in attendance to beat the current record for the world's biggest quiz in a single venue, which was set in Delhi, India in 2017. Get your tickets now at www.utilityarenasheffield.co.uk. Enjoy the rest of your night. See you at the arena on June the 18th. There you go. Uh, the dark destroyer himself from the chase. Um, so he's kicked off uh, our, our questions uh, this evening. But uh, Alison, if we can have the lights on the audience now. What we, we, we have got a few questions Hello, here that um, if you just raise your hand, um, we're going to bring a microphone up so that you can actually ask the question. Those ancient Egyptian neck rests they used for sleeping, they look horribly uncomfortable. Uh -huh. 
Have you or anyone you know ever tried sleeping using one? Yes. <laughs> I have a colleague. I'm doing a, um, a wonderful event uh, this summer, in May actually, as part of a, this, this great arts festival in Scarborough, beautiful Scarborough, called Big Ideas by the Sea. Uh, and she's uh, Dr. Katharina Zinn. She's coming up. Uh, to talk to us and as part of this day school we're doing we're, I'm, I'm going to be banging on about clothes, makeup, wigs, blah blah and Katerina's going to be bringing up um, a, a model headrest uh, that we can all try out because it is eminently comfortable it's rather like the ones um, that uh, they, they have in, in Japanese culture um, and apparently it's it's uh, it's super comfortable. So I'm looking forward to using one of these things. And also, it's worth saying in Egypt, where it's very hot, you can imagine it allowing the the breeze to blow it out the back of your neck rather than having a, a big chunky cushion, you know. Which of course the Egyptians had too. But you can imagine on a warm night with this this neck support. So I'll report back, tell you how it. How and Joe, we've know, got one feels. actually in the exhibition at the twenty two we have, as well. Absolutely. People want to go and have a look yeah. at one of them. But I must admit, it does look a bit uncomfortable. Almost, more like something like a Japanese kind of torture trail, isn't it? <laughs> I can't wait to try one, actually, yeah. Right, so our next question tonight comes from a gentleman called Graham Eggley. How long, from start to finish, do you think it would have taken to build the, two, the Great Pyramids of Gaza? Well, they could only have as long as uh, the monarch was alive, because the minute he popped his clogs, he had to be buried and they had to have finished. Um, so a little over 20 years it's been calculated for the Great Pyramid um, of, of King Khufu um, and he was buried inside it. It's, it's amazing though, 20 years. I know. That basically is a lesson in how to organise a massive, massive workforce. People say, well, you know, the, the Egyptians can't have built the pyramids and it's like, why? It, they could do anything else. They were brilliant, brilliant organisers. They developed the world's earliest writing system. We now know hieroglyphs slightly predate Mesopotamian script, which uh, I, I find quite wonderful as an Egyptologist. But they were able to redeploy people who couldn't work for three months of the year because their farms were underwater. The Nile flooded, uh, you know, every every uh, summer, and so for three months of the year, if you can't farm your land you are redeployed, you are shipped north to Giza and you are uh, put to work, you're given your board, your lodgings and the promise of a share in this eternal afterlife with the king. That was the pattern they used and it clearly worked. Um, and in 1988 they discovered the settlement of the pyramid builders. They found where they slept, where they ate together, so how, the, yeah, to yeah, how the food got to them you know, this really sort of uh, dense bread that they had, this uh, high-carb bread, uh, fresh meat every day, the barley beer that they drank. And so they were just phenomenal organisers, absolutely brilliant. And also, it's also worth emphasising um, that they weren't motivated in the same way we are. They didn't clock on and clock off, and it's like, oh, okay, end of day, you know, let's... Uh, Skype off early. It's this idea of you are working for the, the greater glory of Egypt. You are going to propel your God King into eternity. And if you're lucky, you get to follow him there as well. And so I think the motivation was was very different. But they, they are the most brilliant people on earth to be able to do that. And it's also worth saying that, you know, there are 138 roughly pyramids in Egypt. Of course, they're not all as big as the ones at Giza. Some are much smaller. Um, no two are built the same. Different techniques of, of, of construction and internal uh, layout and so forth. So they are phenomenally interesting, but they were all definitely used as tombs too because I'm often asked that. Why, why do people think they're tombs? Nobody's ever been found inside one. Sorry to burst the bubble. A lot of human remains of the original builders of these pyramids have been found, admittedly, Ancient robbers have got there first, pulled them apart for the valuables. But there are hands, there are torsos. There is one virtually complete mummy um, from around 20, uh, 2200 BC that was found in one of the royal pyramids at Saqqara, now at the Imhotep Museum, displayed there in Egypt. Um, so they are clearly royal tombs. People don't want them to be what tombs, they want them to be God knows what. But they are tombs, and what amazing tombs, the most 
impressive tombs on planet Earth, I think. Joe, you know, um, we're going to get this next question uh, to Tracy uh, McNiff, uh, if you could take that, Davinia, and Tracy could ask the question. But before she does that, I've got to get you on your pet subject. Of course, I, you're wrong, Joe, because it was ancient aliens who built the pyramids. Oh, gee up now. <laughs> How often am I asked that question? Is that, a, is that a definite no? That's a definite no. These people were brilliant. They didn't need help from little green men or, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. They, they did it, and they did it brilliantly. And we've got documentation talking about, you know, how, how these things were done, how the stone was moved. We've got the images showing the Physical huge... Physical remains as well, compressed vertebrae. Yeah, the, the workforce. Yeah. I mean, you compare the, 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 the state of the vertebrae, these poor guys that were hauling all these, these stones on a daily basis. I do basis. believe you. I do believe you. Good. <laughs> uh, right, we've got a question of Tracy, is it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what has changed the most in Egyptology in recent years? Oh, we've got the level of technology that we've we've got available now. I should think, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Probably. I, yeah. I think just to further that, we had a, a, an interesting chat talking about how you still think that we could find tombs that makes Tutankhamun's tomb look like Woolworths. That was a quote from the great John Roma. He said, "We still need to find the tomb of Harry Hall, one of the missing pharaohs." And he said, "If that was ever found, it would make." But with the, with, but with, with the like kind Woolworths. of the X-ray penetrating kind of technologies that we've now got, and it might make it a little easier to find from satellites or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's possible, Joe? And in I think our it lifetime, is. I think it is. I mean, you've got some amazing archaeologists in the field today. I mean, one of the most brilliant, um, uh, Professor Sarah Parchak. Uh, from the States who's called a space archaeologist and she uses Google Earth to look at the, the surface of the desert and to sort of see where um, possible uh, uh, excavation sites are. What, a, what an inspiration, you know, and cutting-edge technology as well. So, Tracy, is that good enough for you? Right. Nice right, one. now, uh, Davinia, I need to get you... I think we can leave the mic up there, but I think you need to ask the question because we've got somebody else set up in that area. Would you mind taking this up to... I think this is... Elizabeth Hurst? I'll get you fit, Davinian, by the end of the week. Um, what would be your personal favourite artefact discovered in the last few years? Uh, when you say last few years... <laughs> Give or take a millennium. Can I have, can I have like, um, something in the 1980s? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> easy, easy. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? Um, there's the, the most perfect, most beautiful, most sublime statue ever, 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 ever. And that was found beneath the floor of Luxor Temple, I believe it was 1989, of a certain Amenhotep III, who might just be, apart from Stephen, my favourite guy ever. Just <laughs> Tutankhamun's grandfather, he's in the exhibition. He, whew, flipping out. He was, he was just the business. And this statue of him was found, and it was perfect. And it's now on display in Luxor Museum of Ancient Art. It's it's exquisite. It's in quartzite. The face is amazing. The detail, the clothing, the costume, superb. So, yeah, that's definitely my favourite. Cool. Excellent. All right, well, listen, that... Say, oh, read, of course you can. <laughs> my granny used to saw Peter Pigs in the back. Isn't that a bit like mummified? Because it used to... Turn them from like the flesh into bacon. The bath we used to get bathing on a Friday, but during the week she's all peated the pigs. Is that a bit like? Mummy it is family? similar. Yeah. Is it? It is. It is. Yeah. And actually, in the case of Egyptian mummification, when it was at its best, they actually had to cover the body in resin and oil and wax to protect it from the um, yeah from the the salt solution because otherwise it would go ghost white. Uh, whereas you put that, that protective layer on and the skin tone, perfectly preserved, fantastically preserved. So again, they knew what they were doing. Uh, but yeah, yeah, definitely similar. Amazing. Thanks for the question, Rita. Thank you very much for that. Well, folks, that's uh, that's about it. We've Is just, that it? Yeah. We've only we're done, just getting started We've only done two hours. I did say this was going to be like the Ken Dodd show and that we could probably still be here at midnight. <laughs> But I guess this gives us a great excuse to come back and do it all over oh, again, yeah, guys. Please. There'll be lots more sure. that we can talk yeah. about. 
Um, but um, I do want to give special thanks to uh, Barnsley College uh, for hosting um, uh, tonight's mm -hmm. event. Um, also to Front Row Live, who have been doing a sterling job um, uh, with the audiovisual in the room and, um, and to the live stream that we've had as well. Um, uh, and also, I wanted to give special thanks to Barnsley Museums uh, yeah. uh, uh, and to the Heritage Trust as well. Not least of all to Lynn Dunning, who I think has yeah. been watching from home, to uh, Davinia uh, Skiros here, who's been going around with the microphone this morning. She's just wonderful. And to Alison Cooper as well, who has been terrific in terms of helping to uh, produce a lot of the shows and curate a lot of the exhibitions that you'll see here um, with, at Barnes & Museums. And all, all the front of house staff at Barnes & Museums. Yeah. All brilliant. the front of house staff, brilliant. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I did just want to mention that um, the Barnsley Museums Heritage Trust, um, which helped fund the museum service, Thanks for buying your tickets tonight. You've already contributed, but um, if you do want an augmented reality poster, Joe might even sign it. Yeah, man. Be a self of them as well. <laughs> um, for a, if you throw a quid at us, I'm sure that that'll help just um, yeah. uh, boost the coffers a little bit more as well. Um, um, uh, my name's Graham Walker, and it's um, been an absolute pleasure to have uh, done this tonight. And like I said, I'm looking forward to doing more of these, and particularly again with Joe and Steve. Um, and obviously to our special guests. So uh, another round of applause, please, for <laughs> Professor John Fletcher and Stephen Fletcher. Thanks a lot for watching.